Hi folks, um, as you can see we have uh, two papers in this session. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Paul Carr from the uh, University of Glamorgan, where he's head of the Music Academy, will talk about uh, the relationship between higher education and live music. Paul's presentation will be in a kind of sort of traditional academic 20 minute paper type thing, um, after which I'll invite uh, Hamish Burchill up to join me and that, that part of this, of this session will be more in the form of a kind of question and answer session around the 2003 Licensing Act and recent changes uh, with the 2012 Live Music Act. So uh, first of all, over to Paul. Thanks, Mon. Um, yeah, this talk is it's going to be about the projects I'm involved in at the moment uh, for the Higher Education Academy, um, looking at the relationship of um, live music uh, with higher education. So that's generally what the talk's about. It does touch on some of the other initiatives I've been involved in as well, so hopefully it will all become clear as I progress through. There's, there's been a number of recent reports, including my own for the Welsh Music Foundation, which was published last year, that outlines the, the economic significance of, of live music to, to Wales as a nation. Um, Live music's importance is corroborated by statistics from the likes of Mintel, the Arts Council of Wales, Credit and Cultural Skills, all of whom confirm its cultural and, and economic importance. Even taking into account the most recent calculations from the Perform and Rights Society, which estimates the value of UK live music to be retracting. The live music industry sector provides Wales with an income of around about £60 million pounds per year based on a 4% share of the UK's total revenue, a figure which provides a foundation and a, and a great incentive for, for future growth. However, any plans to exploit opportunities in live music in Wales must be implemented sympathetically and realistically. Data from creative and cultural skills suggest that Wales constitutes only 4% of the UK employment for music as an entity, which not surprisingly is dominated by uh, London at 29% and South East England at 19%. Of course, you know, suggesting that music um, you know, is popular in, in, in urban areas. Um, as discussed in a 2008 conference at the University of Glamorgan, live music at a, at a local level is often dominated with rhetoric concerning how international artists have a tendency to, to bypass Wales when touring, something which is often connected to the lack of mid-sized venues within the capital. And in fact, something I've just discussed with, um, with, with uh, Stuart from Kilimanjaro just to, uh, a couple of hours ago, who also believes we need an arena type venue, although judging from the recent discussion that isn't going to happen if Bristol is the, the, the number two. Um, but in 2008, I, I asked uh, a few questions on a, on a blog of mine um, about live music in Wales. Firstly, why is it that some agents don't feel compelled to send their artists to Wales? Is there a misconception that there, there aren't enough venues, venues in Wales? Are there a lack of mid-sized venues in Wales? And once bands actually get to a certain size, <coughs> can they continue to play in Wales? So can they keep coming back and working their way up the ranks? Are transport systems good enough to get people to and from Cardiff and some of the more re remote areas and venues in Wales? <coughs> Is there a perception that car people can simply go to Bristol to see a gig? And in the north, there's also a perception that if you live in Wrexham, you go to Liverpool to see a gig. What's the infrastructure in Cardiff in terms of generating media coverage for bands? How do we find out about the music that's going on? Do potential audiences feel informed in terms of what's happening in the capital in Wales? Are some bands in too much of a hurry to play bigger venues? before they're ready. I think that's a particular issue in the Welsh language sector. You hear this a lot where uh, young bands uh, get opportunities to play on national radio not long after they've actually formed. And it's, as I say, prevalent in the, in the Welsh language sector because there are opportunities to get on the radio if you actually sing in Welsh. How could the Welsh Assembly Government 
help with some of these issues. Although there's been a select few reports and essays written since this post, many of the questions are still unanswered and offer pertinent opportunities for higher education to explore. Written at the same time as this blog post, in addition to the BBC South West Wales website, highlights a number of issues perceived by some to be specifically relevant to West Wales, such as the lack of interest from local bands to play live, the scarcity of semi-big acts performing in relatively big towns such as Swansea, the over-reliance on tribute, tribute act performances, and the importance of local community working together to make live music happen. In terms of international success, bands emerging during the Cool Cumbry period in the mid-1990s probably best represents the peak of the musical exportation of Welsh culture, with Newport prompting one author at the time, this is in the mid-90s, to describe the town and its surrounding valleys as having potentially, and I quote, the world's highest concentration of young quality rock bands. A 2010 seminar organised by the Welsh Music Foundation in Cardiff um, stock it outlined the, the degree to which the one vibrant music scene in Newport had changed. And the demise is probably best highlighted by the closure of TJ's, it's a really famous venue in, in Newport. A venue that once hosted numerous local and international artists such as Catatonia, Blood from a Valentine, Smashing Pumpkins, there was even a legend that uh, Nirvana played there, although everyone tells me they didn't. <laughs> That's the rhetoric. Um, reasons suggested at the seminar for the decline were, were really wide-ranging, but it included factors such as poor relationships between local councils, promoters and venues, inconsistent relationships between venues and national promoters, local bands just omitting Newport, preferring to play in Cardiff instead, and a perceived lack of general safety within the city. All of these were issues that came through. And it appears that these issues need to be considered as a matter of urgency, as a vibrant local scene is obviously essential if we're to move into international exploitation. exploitation. Um, and, and also, it's an essential factor in ensuring that intellectual property actually stays within the principality. That's a big issue within Wales, about how do we hang on to the intellectual property within the nation. I'm, I'm saying this as an Englishman, but these are just the observations that I found over the years. Um, issues such as these make it particularly important for the live music industry of a small, largely rural location such as Wales to work with partners such as the Arts Council, government and of course higher education in order to identify and exploit available opportunities. The research I mentioned earlier by Creative and Cultural Skills also suggests that, and I quote, there's a disparity between what is available through the formal education sector and what the music industry actually needs, and that many employers are used to the fact that the education system produces graduates without the skills they need, without questioning what could be done, end quote. According to an earlier 2009 report by Creative and Cultural Skills, the dominant reason for perceptions such as these is not seen as being qualification related, but is simply put down to the lack of experience on the part of the candidates. It's proposed that this development of a symbiotic union between the music industry and higher education is one of the biggest challenges our, our sector faces in my view. The research for the Higher Education Academy builds upon a number of projects I've been involved in over the last few years, um, which are related to the Welsh music industry. Um, in addition to the research that I've done um, for the Welsh Music Foundation, which I presented at the last conference that Mark and Simon put on in, I think it was March last year, there's another couple of papers which I've, I, I just thought I would mention. Um, yeah, a paper uh, published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Applied Research in the Higher Education. At the university, we've sort of formed a strategic partnership, or we have formed a strategic partnership with Rome, the musical music manufacturing company. And that paper investigated the, um, the sort of cultural differences 
between the two organisations. Also in 2010, a, a, a paper uh, published in um, Popular Music History, which looks at the way that um, Welsh-speaking musicians in Wales quite often have to compromise their identity when they sing in English. Something that, again, is something that's come through a lot in the interviews that I've conducted over the last few years. And I've also had a few funded projects, uh, one by the Beacons for Public Engagement and another one by the Millennium Stadium Char Charitable Trust. And the most recent one is by the European Social Fund. And all of them have involved live music to, to some degree. And I'd just like to quickly give you a quick overview of the European Social Fund project because I think it's got potential. We're one year into the project at the moment and I think it's got potential for ways that higher education can work with the live music sector. Um, the, it, it was, the project started in September 2011 and um, the money given was essentially to develop and run a, a foundation degree in music industry entrepreneurship. So we've got our first sort of cohort of students going through at the moment. It's a, it's a distance learning program, so all of the students on the course um, are in the music industry to some degree. Most of them are full-time, we've got one or two part-time students as well. And it's aimed specifically at the convergence areas of Wales. Obviously I'm not sure if there's any convergence areas in Scotland, but in the UK, Wales has got a high percentage of the nation is in the convergence area, so it opens up funding streams um, for initiatives such as this. Uh, as I say, the first cohort started in 2011, and the idea is that it facilitates music industry practitioners to gain academic credit for the experience they've already got, so we can accredit them for accreditation for prior learning and also for qualifications that they've already got through accreditation for prior certificated learning. And what we also do, we accredit what they're currently doing in the workplace. So what this has meant, the, 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 the people who are organized and working full-time in the industry, it's possible to actually do the entire foundation degree, which is normally a two-year full-time course, in one year part-time. This is what we're finding, we can fast-track these people because uh, they can claim this experience and obviously uh, gain academic credit for what they're doing. And we're also considering at the moment the, the use of um, shell units. Um, uh, the, what, what the idea of the shell unit is, is um, we, we, we can have a 20 credit unit where a student can potentially go into industry and gain academic credit for a sort of an internship. And we're not just doing this in the in, in this course, we're actually looking at this as the university as a whole. But it's, I think it offers interesting possibilities for, for engaging with the live music sector. Uh, yeah, as I say, all of the students are, are, are working in the live music sector who are on the course at the moment, to some degree, at the moment. Um, just a few notes on the, on the methodology of, of what I'm doing. A review of literature surrounding issues of employability and government policy and current thinking in the live music sector is currently being undertaken, which will subsequently be used as the basis to formulate the general structure of the research and the subsequent report. This has been accompanied by the implementation of an online questionnaire in which a range of stakeholders in the Welsh and to a lesser extent the UK industry have been asked to participate, and if anyone would like to participate, the URL is there. So please feel free to do that, I'd appreciate that. Um, the intention of the questionnaire is, alongside the review of literature, to, to obtain an initial broad understanding of the key issues surrounding employability on the part, the part that higher education can play in assisting the development of the live music industry in Wales. While the data from the questionnaire is assimilated, a number of face-to-face -face interviews with stakeholders in the live music industry um, are taking place, and I've actually interviewed some people in this room already. Um, and it ranges from organisations such as the Major Events Unit, the Welsh Music Foundation, local councils, festival organisers. I've interviewed Stuart, Stuart Dalbraith before, the Musicians Union, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, musicians as well. I've interviewed quite a lot of musicians over the last couple of months. 
prior to the report being finalized, it's important to know that I intend to use feedback from the presentation of two conferences. I did one two days ago in Kingston, and this is the second one in a week, so that's why I'm looking so tired. Um, <clears throat> although not specifically investigating how the live music industry of Wales can work with higher education, my earlier report, Invest in, Investigating the Live Music Industry in Wales, a critical analysis for the Welsh Music Foundation, did contain a number of factors which are relevant to both higher education and the live music industry. An overarching finding from the report included the need for government to encourage more research and postgraduate study into the Welsh music industry. And though the current investigation can be considered part of this ongoing process, opportunities for reciprocal relationships between higher education and the live music industry through knowledge transfer partnerships were identified as a potential way forward. An archetype of how a model such as, such as this could work in Wales anyway is encapsulated in the recent partnership between Bangor University and the largest record label in Wales, Sign Records. With the added value of the partnership reportedly increasing the profit margins of the label by a third, in addition to revolutionising, this is the record coming from the, 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 the sort of uh, report of the partnership, um, revolutionising the industry links of the university. So it's apparent that both higher education and the live music industry would argu arguably benefit from relationships such as this. In fact, the live music exchange is another example of this type of partnership. Another potential higher education, live music um, interrelationship outlined in the report that I just mentioned, there, there, there's quite a few of them, but I would like to just quickly go through a few more recommendations that I, that I came up with before I conclude. Um, yeah, so firstly, the development of a potentially accredited music, a potentially accredited music promotion program that's specifically aimed at the Welsh sector. And potentially accredited, I use the word potentially very carefully because a lot of people I speak to in the music industry, in, including Stuart Galbraith, who I've just spoke, spoken to, are, are very skeptical of the need for a qualification. The skills seem to be very much more important than the qualification. This comes through, it came through to me anyway from lots of different people. The accreditation of a kind marking standard, which are they're currently being developed by the Musicians' Union at the moment, but perhaps those could be accredited in built into university programmes. Uh, to investigate how skill shortages reported by creative and cultural skills, how, are they, how do they resonate within the nation of Wales? The need to develop alternative business models and new technologies that are specifically aimed at the Welsh music industry. To develop accredited training events which empower the Welsh live music industry with knowledge on how government decisions impact practitioner careers. I think it's really important because musicians quite often, generally speaking, seem to be quite unaware of how these decisions impact their careers. To develop training schemes that empower the live music industry with knowledge on how to take advantage of emerging funding opportunities. There's a, a million pounds just become available from the Welsh Government in Wales um, called the Music Industry Development Fund. And it's all seed grants of £5,000. Most musicians just don't know how to go about applying for that. So perhaps some sort of training event which empowers them with those skills would possibly help. For higher education providers to assist local councils to develop training in grassroots subject areas, such as Hamish's 2003 Licensing Act, who I'm sure he will explain all about that next. Um, and also how to put on events training on how to put on events. For higher education to explore the interrelationship between live music and cultural tourism in Wales, totally unexplored so far. And for higher education to investigate in a detailed way the reasons why Wales as a nation suffers from slow ticket sales. It just does and no one understands why. To explore cost-effective online ticket sales mechanism that potentially bypasses Ticketmaster Again, so that we can actually keep some of the money inside of the nation. Although these issues are very broad and from a higher education perspective will require some sort of external funding, they represent an example of some indicative areas that would foster productive relationships 
between live music, the Welsh Assembly Government, and higher education. So just a few sort of concluding points. Regarding live music industry mapping, it's apparent that Wales at present falls some way behind a number of other small nations. For example, although not, not, although not all are conducted by university departments, many small nations have already conducted mapping exercises into their respective industries. And that ranges from nations such as Trinidad and Tobago, Senegal, of course Scotland, um, even the northwest of England, a region of England, if it has conducted a mapping exercise into the industry. Although these mapping exercises include research into the music industry as an entity, as opposed to the live music sector, um, they, they serve as useful indicative examples of how the, the Welsh Assembly Government, the Arts Council of Wales, hopefully with the assistance of higher education, could conduct research, more research into live music. On the, on the subject of, of purely academic research into the music industry of small nations, it's apparent that Wales could potentially benefit from the stance of nations such as Canada, whose radio and television content regulations have since the early 70s aimed to increase the amount of high quality Canadian talent. With radio play authorities currently stipulating that 35% of the content uh, played on the radio in Canada uh, needs to be of Canadian origin. Uh, Scott Henderson outlines how this policy which is also implemented in France, I think, and I think Australia as well, has facilitated Canadian bands to be, quote, an accepted part of the music scene for contemporary Canadian youth, with the policies that have been put in place being successful in constructing an emerging Canadian popular music industry. The importance of local music gaining a presence on radio was also outlined by Roy Shakur when discussing the prog progressive development of the music industry in New Zealand was a 1986 report by the Royal Commission at Broadcasting and Related Telecommunications in New Zealand recommending that 10% of music composed, arranged, performed, or recorded and produced by New Zealand citizens or, re or residents on radio. Although this pro proposal was subsequently rejected, the emergence of New Zealand on air in the early 90s used the annual broadcasting fee from television and radio licenses to finance localised media and culture, including music. Although not directly related to live music, a subsidy for local videos in the early 90s was seen to have a snowball effect, where television play led to record sales, which led to local music being played on radio, leading to more sales, higher chart listings, and so on and so forth. And uh, although Shukar he doesn't allude to live music in the essay, in, 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 in this particular essay. Obviously, the relationship between record sales and radio and live music, um, it, it, it's, it's there for all to see. And I feel the need to consider the broader picture of local content quota, for want of a better way of describing it, um, can offer opportunities for Wales. Perhaps not on the radio, but perhaps in uh, the live events that we put on, perhaps a percentage of the income generated from live events it needs to go back into the nation. There needs to be something built into this. Um, most importantly, how does Wales obtain the balance between what is perceived as the cultural authenticity of the language and simple, pure economics? I think that's an issue that the nation really does face if we're to move forward financially. Um, and finally, um, you know, what research can be undertaken and what sort of education programs can we develop in order to assist the nation increase that 4% share in the UK total. Final slide, this is the end really, but I, just before coming here, I, this is right at the beginning of the research that I'm doing, but I, I had a quick look at some of the university programs that actually deal with live music. And not surprisingly, there aren't any in Wales, but also looking at some of these programs, and I, I don't profess that this is an exhaustive list, but um, many of them aren't actually in music departments either. They're in departments that aren't music departments. So I think you know there are gaps in the market there that perhaps we all could explore um, and how to take these things forward. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.
I, I asked a question earlier about the link between radio and yes, live music, know, which probably yeah. shows my interest in, in there, and you do refer to all the sort of major attempts to do it, but this isn't a question, this is a, a commentary really. Sure. Um, it's quite easy to, to see the effects of, the, of those as quite positive, but they're usually quite complicated. If you take the French example that you cited where there was, I think, I think from memory, a 40% quota. Yeah. Um, and I think the people who constructed that law imagined that that French tradition of chanson would take, take to the air. Um, but actually, if there was any result at all, it was bringing lots of really interesting recorded music associated with the Caribbean and North American dis diasporas into, into France. Mm. And I, that's probably the most exaggerated example no, where it didn't have the effect that it was imagined. Je yes. Jeffrey Hare's done a good study on that, by the way. Mm. But um, the, uh, it, it's very hard to predict mostly radio stations are going to try and get round it and, and to achieve something else and I think you're right to pick on the New Zealand study that seemed to be the most successful largely because it wasn't a regulatory one um, yes it was optional but strongly encouraged that's, that's well I think I think there was a sort of a threat if you don't do this yes <laughs> someone will change the law um, uh, but it, uh, I think what was what was more important there is it came at a particular moment yeah and I think it is linked to the way that you were describing a small nation and their interest in their live music scenes and their, and their culture. But something that's not come up particularly strongly um, so far today is the link of live music to recorded music. And what's I think interesting about small nations is the way that they can very effectively tie those things, those things together. So I'm sorry there was no question there. I no, it's a good point. point. Yeah, thanks. I hope it's like my useful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to cite an example from Cardiff because, because we work for the same institution, but I don't think it's a uh, Welsh specific answer I'm looking for. Is there, any, is there a danger that, by, and you talked about the need for sensitivity in the PA, yeah. is there ever a danger that academic institutions get involved in the live music scene and kind of suck the life out of it? And, and my, to cite the example, I would say that um, the Welsh College, the World Welsh College of Music, Cardiff has started its own open mic transition. And well, since that, the one the organic one that happened in town has, has more or less died. Mm. So I just just by getting insensitively insensitively involved, is there a danger that and I don't know what it's like here in Leeds that we're in a similar situation, but um, is there a danger we can suck the life out of that organic local healthy scene if we're not if we're not careful? Mm. I mean my my, my personal view, I think, I think Simon mentioned it right at the start, that, that, that I think as soon as someone sees doctor before your name, there's, there's skepticism when you try and engage with the music industry. And it takes a little while to sort of say, well, you know, I was an ex-professional musician. I, I tend to play on that because, uh, you know, it, I think the research needs to be meaningful. At the end of the day, that's what I would say. As Paul is just writing the research for the sake of what we try I, I, what I'm trying to do with this, it's not really my area of expertise, if I'm honest. You know, my PhD was in musicology, but uh, I, I'd like to think it could have some sort of impact, and some some impact on the way that things can move forward. So yeah, no, I'm not I'm not specifically referring to your research. I'm thinking of um, just by you know, for instance, if we're teaching people how to do promotion, then. Mm. People then become sure. promoters in order to fulfil an academic assignment rather than because there's this band that they, it's a good point. they want to see in their town and they want all their mates to see. And that's the usual reason. For yeah, absolutely right. I agree. Yeah. Promotion. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, um, yeah. I think we've only got time for one more actually because we are pretty yeah. close against time. I'm, I'm really sorry, Steve. Right, this, this is so partly the frustrated higher education manager, manager in me coming out today. Um, there's this extraordinary contradiction between that traditional speech the Vice Chancellor gives to incoming students where he or she says, um, the jobs you're going to be doing when you graduate haven't been invented yet. You know, I've heard that a million times. And then discussions with industry, it doesn't matter which sector you look at, uh, where their eyes glaze over the minute you mention their qualifications. And they say, 
They're not interested in qualifications. Yeah. And again, that's been going on for 30 years, 40 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And, and they get in universities, our universities, unconstitutionally incapable of accepting some of the ramifications of that. In one sense, universities ought to be the first people to say, whoopee. Um, because we normally believe that what we do is to shape um, the way the student engages with the world. Yeah. The qualification is merely an indicator of something to do with that, but it is not the thing in itself. Mm. Um, that, that's really the, the burden of what I'm saying. Right? Because this, should this not make us a bit more curious about things like, I mentioned a particular example at Leeds Man, which was a cultural partnership with Festival Republic, um, which is of course a huge event, and that has a massive events management program, um, which is very good. Um, but in fact, the students on events management were only a tiny proportion of the students who benefited from that, and who went on to get jobs in the music industry, because, because of the inventiveness of Festival Republic themselves, and the good conversation that happened, which was all completely off curriculum, in one sense, completely outside the qualification, um, but it was about performing arts students doing things, it was about film students doing things, bringing their own particular skills and understanding. And if I was recruiting for an organisation, those students would have given me exactly what I was looking for, not a qualification, but a kind of gut understanding of what mm. it takes to get something done. Yeah. I think the problem, was, yeah, go on. It's, it's been able, you can't measure those things. And, you know, in higher education, we, 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 we like yeah. measuring things and qualifications, especially if they're in neat little blocks of 20 credits, they're, they're, they're easy to measure. Um, that ESF funded course I mentioned before, try to sort of engage with industry in, in a slightly more, in a, you know, a way that perhaps meets them halfway, but, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but, it, but I agree with everything you say. Uh, totally, everyone would agree with you, I would imagine. Can I just have a comment to that? As someone from the events management department. One of the worst aspects of that for us was that we already actually had students going into those festivals and being paid because they'd got, most of them had got some experience in the building. And to some extent, it was just cheap stewards for the festivals. Mm -hmm. And now everybody does it. Yeah. Which is a little sad. Thank you for